Well, good morning, boys and girls. It's a special edition of Ask the Experts. Don't let that intro throw you because we have a an estrogen-filled crew today of financial wizards who happen to be women. And I'm so happy to bring someone new into the Ask the Experts studio. So let me first um, introduce our newest edition, Julie Jason. Julie. Hi, Jill. Are you excited? I'm very excited. Let me do your bio a little bit here. So Julie Jason is a personal money manager. She began her career as a securities lawyer on Wall Street. So she went from law to managing money. So she did, never would, could break a, a rule. She's a president of Jackson Grant Investment Advisors in Stanford, blah, blah, blah. She's registered, all those good things. She's big into financial literacy. She wrote investment books. She's got her fifth book, the AARP Retirement Survival Guide, How to Make Smart Financial Decisions in Good Times and Bad. It was released last year. She's, she's rocking and rolling, so welcome <laughs> to Ask the Experts. Well, thank you, Joe. We also have the queen in the house, Jane Bryan Quinn, is here. I don't know. I don't even really feel like I have to introduce you. Your well, name speaks for itself. Okay, well, can the tiara this time? No tiara. No uh, okay. tiara. We made a deal. Hold on a second. You brought it up. <laughs> you I, brought it up. I, you said queen. I didn't say tiara. I said you're the queen of personal finance. Right. I, I wasn't going to do it. I accept it. All right. Okay, so <laughs> Jane Bryan Quinn, if you don't know, is uh, a leading commentator on personal finance, books, columns. She's a blogger here at Money Watch. She is just, she's amazing. She also has her own website, Jane Bryant Quinn. Quinn.com. She's on the board of Bloomberg LP. Can you get us a Bloomberg terminal here for a good deal? Uh, I can get you a wonderful deal, only 5% over normal cost. Aha, very good. Excellent. <laughs> I mean, isn't this what directors do? That's, look out for my company. Oh, you are so good. <laughs> anyway, she also uh, recently founded a company called Main Street Connect, which is bringing online local news to towns and cities that are losing their local newspapers. Jane Bryan Quinn completing the Jill Jane and Julie show. This is very exciting. So, ladies, we are here, and uh, you know, just a sort of a momentous day. I mean, I know that we bumped it from yesterday to today, but today is even better because we have a bill that has been passed in the Senate for financial regulatory reform. Jane Bryan Quinn, how are you feeling this morning? I'm feeling really happy. Well, everybody would have expected that this bill was going to be weaker than the bill that was in the House, but thank you, Goldman Sachs. <laughs> <laughs> because of the, the fraud suit and you know Lloyd Blankfein saying he's doing God's work and all these things, every, it kind of focused everybody's anger on Wall Street. And all of a sudden, the Senate was hearing from people, all their constituents saying, you got to do something. And it got tougher and tougher and tougher. This is a much stronger bill than we would have expected. And I am thrilled about the Consumer uh, Financial Protection Bureau. It's not you know, I can think of some improvements if I were writing the bill myself, but it is much stronger than we expected. And I think that we're going to be very happy. We still have to make a deal with the House. So the Senate and the House have to get together. This isn't the final. But this is a very strong bill, and I'm excited about it. Jane is excited. Julie, you represent a lot of different kinds of investors, right, in your practice. And so what do you think that investors, regular people who you serve, what do they want to know about this bill? What is going to, how do you think that they're going to react to this today? All right, that's a, that, uh, that's a great way to look at it because if you, right now the consumer is just unaware of what's in the bill. And neither, neither, neither are we, you know, you know, in terms of the very, the specifics. So from a consumer perspective, what we want to know is, is there anything that's stronger in terms of possibly disclosure, uh, possibly the old fiduciary duty argument? You know, are different advisors held to different duties? And yes, they are, but the consumer's unaware of that. So those are the types of issues that, that I'd like to see. And I, and I don't know whether they're covered in the bill. You know, it's interesting because... Uh, Jane and I always like to talk about the fiduciary standard. We call it the F word around the house here. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's interesting because what it, it appears that happened in the drafting of this bill is that some of the fiduciary language got dropped, actually. Mm -hmm. And there was even some some talk about, especially in aftermath of the Goldman Sachs fiasco, that should there be a fiduciary standard imposed on broker dealers, should they have to actually put their clients first? Didn't make it. 
So That's right. Jane, right. are we bummed about that? Yeah, I'm, I'm bummed about that. When I when I said that I would I would rewrite some of this bill if I could, I sure would put the fiduciary duty uh, business back in because I think that's important. People just don't understand that it is okay for their broker to put the broker's interest first and to put your interest second, and that you know if there's two mutual funds, it's and what you need is a mutual fund. It's okay for the broker to sell you the one that's the higher cost without disclosing this to you, unless you read the prospectus, of course, which nobody does. So. <laughs> So it's okay for him to do that or her to do that because that's better for the broker, not better for you. This is absolutely unacceptable as far as I'm concerned. Unfortunately, that is a, a thing we lost with uh, with this bill. But, you know, maybe it'll come along at another time. What we gain from this Consumer Protection Bureau, though, is uh, a regulator, I hope. I hope we have a good regulator. Always depends on that. Who's going to be able to look at all of these predatory lending practices. For example, these mortgage practices where the mortgage brokers are steering you to higher uh, interest and getting kickbacks for doing it when you don't even realize that. They, they're going to be able to look at all this. They're going to be able to write rules. They're going to be able to force more disclosure. Uh, you know, there's a, they, the uh, credit uh, bureau, your credit history, all that stuff is now under this new uh, Consumer Protection Bureau. So we don't know, you know exactly what the bureau is going to do, but they have far more authority. Under the Senate bill, we have more authority than we would have expected. That's an amazing thing. And by the way, just talking a little bit about the um, some of the details of this, so uh, that the uh, mortgage lenders, not only are they going to sort of not be prevented from paying people to steer you into weird products, but they're also going to um, limit the ability of mortgage lenders to affect, assess these strange fees and penalties that come out of nowhere. Um, I'm still looking for the one-page prospectus. I'm looking for the one-page disclosure that should be accompanied with any financial product that says, here's what it is, here's what it costs, and by the way, see this big stuff in bold, like the stuff that says smoking is harmful to your health? <laughs> something like that. I something, mean, something that says you should not buy this under any exactly. circumstances. <laughs> <laughs> like there's a very close, the fine line. Now, I, I just want to get back to that fiduciary standard, because I know, Julie, you're, you're registered as a fiduciary, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, you know, just so you guys understand this, this means that when Julie gives advice to her client, she's got to put their interest before her own or her firm's. Doesn't that seem reasonable? Doesn't that seem like a really smart thing to do? And yet 80% of the advice givers in this country don't have to do that. Does that drive you nuts, Julie? Well, it, it, it's very interesting because, again, the consumer doesn't realize the difference. And the, what it means to the consumer is that you have to ask more questions. So bottom line is whether you have a fiduciary standard or you don't have a fiduciary standard, what's important is that the consumer know that questions are the most important thing. So, uh, so they have to ask, how much are you getting paid for making this recommendation to me? Not how much am I going to pay? What's my commission? But mm -hmm. so you have to turn it the other way around to ask the the whatever financial advisor you're working with, how much are you getting paid for making this recommendation? What else did you consider before you made this recommendation? And to Jane's point, uh, it's just it's just not something that people are aware of. Hey. So with I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt. So I just have a quick question. Uh, JBQ, I have a, a good uh, credit card question that, that seems to be uh, something you could definitely answer. So this is from Kimberly. She says, I'm in the process of paying off all of my credit cards. I was wondering if it's best to keep the cards after they are paid off or is it best to close the accounts? I've heard good and bad uh, on both sides. What do you think the answer is to that? Because people are really now they are starting to clock away at that that nasty old debt. And we're improving credit scores, and we're going to get better records on our on our credit reports. But what about this idea about keeping some credit card lines open? I certainly think you should keep, to begin with, you should keep your oldest credit cards for sure. Because part of the thing that goes into your credit score and your credit history is how long you have had uh, particular credit cards, how long you've had credit, how long you have shown that you are a good user of credit. So the older ones are especially important to keep. And you know, I have three or four credit cards sitting around that I don't use anymore. I haven't bothered closing them. If you have 18 credit cards, you know I'd close them up because it, <laughs> it looks as if you've really got a lot of potential credit you could suddenly acquire 
and that would hurt your credit rating. But I would close them. I'd close them before you have to have, uh, 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 before you apply for a particular loan that's important to you. Because when you close credit cards, your credit score may take a tiny little hit depending on how the numbers work out. But over the long run, it doesn't make any difference. You're better off with uh, with fewer cards. But keep those older ones, even if you're not using them. Ah, uh, the, they're oldies but goodies. <laughs> So let me ask you another question. I got one for Miss Julie. Let's do a little, we're taking some questions now. If you've got a question, please do send it to us. Ask the experts at moneywatch.com. Ask the experts at moneywatch.com or click on the link at the side of our homepage and send us a question. Uh, we're here to answer anything. It could be about regulatory reform. It could be about your personal financial life. See, I always love this because we, we are all excited about this big, huge regulatory reform. I cut out this fabulous graph. You can't even see it from the Financial Times. And it just shows the major uh, re regulatory reforms that have occurred, you know, since 1933. This is up there. The Securities Act of 1933, which also included Glass-Steagall. Securities Act of 1934. Investment Company Act of 1940. Bank Holding Companies, 1956. Uh, Graham Leach Bliley, you know what that did, blew everything up. Sarbanes-Oxley, that was after the tech bubble. And here we are. So we made it into the top eight for the century and a half. Okay. Uh, can I say something about Sarbanes-Oxley, uh, which not? is you know, kind of mysterious? Let me, let me say, the, the, the big thing about the, the, this was a thank you, Enron, because this was a reform that we got because it, we weren't going to get it through, and then Enron came along, and suddenly everybody said, oh, my God, we have to do something. And one of the things that was required under uh, Sarbanes-Oxley is that you were had to have better accounting, internal uh, reforms. They had a bill that went to companies and said, let me see what you're doing, your, uh, how you're accounting so we can see if you're a fraud or not well this was great and we passed it was really terrific so now what are they doing they are trying to while we are getting a stronger bill on the consumer side here also in Congress is something that is trying to undermine that wonderful uh, bill that, that uh, Sarbanes-Oxley that says they're going to exempt a whole bunch of companies, s smaller companies, from the re accounting requirements. Well, who does the biggest frauds? Well, you get Enron here, you get WorldCom, but it's the small companies where there's tremendous fraud. They're exempting them. So even as we speak, you, you've got to keep an eye on the kind of reform that went before because now they're trying to undermine that reform, and so that's something else you got to watch out for. Oh, I love that. A little Warning sign. We got to get mm -hmm. some good, um, you know, we got to get graphics and we have to get some sounders like a wah, wah. That's what we'll do that. <laughs> I got a couple more questions here. And, you know, to your point, Jane, you know, oftentimes when I was a financial advisor, I would always laugh because people would say, oh, you know, I hate the big banks. But sometimes those little banks sold you some serious crap, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you go into your bank branch and they're like, oh, well, let me got this little thing here for sale. And you'd say, well, how did I get this? So, Here's something that's interesting that uh, Katie wrote in and says, I have an annuity savings held by an insurance company created through my local bank. <laughs> what I think she means is she had an annuity sold to her from her local bank. And she wants to know, what is this a good investment? So let's, uh, and we also have, a, we also have another annuity question. So, but, but an annuity um, sold by a bank, I generally imagine that um, in, in, say, 10 years ago, this was probably a variable annuity, but we don't know whether it's a fixed or a variable. So, ladies, are we fans of the variable annuities or fixed annuities or not? Wow, what a great layup. Go, Julie. <laughs> Sna smack that one down. Uh, yeah, I personally am not a fan of a very complicated product because, again, y you know, if I'm thinking in terms of is it understandable, is it, is it a product that someone can, if they can tell me why they shouldn't buy it, then maybe they understand the product. But variable annuities are very, very tough to understand. And part of the reason is that there are a lot of, a lot of um, nuances and new features. So one of the new types of products uh, is a product that guarantees that you won't lose money and also makes a promise that you'll make money when the market goes up. I'm going to be the consumer for a second. That yeah. sounds good, Julie. And, and throw in lifelong income. <gasps> All that, and All that. maybe even an ice cream cone or something. <laughs> so why shouldn't I buy that? That sounds Wrap, awesome. Wrapped up in a pink package. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, you have to read the prospectus. I hate to say it. Oh, but. come on. <laughs> I'm not going to read the prospectus. So you tell me. This is another warning. Variable annuities. <laughs> wah, wah, wah. Okay. They're bad. Yeah. If, if you hear uh, promises that just sound just, just like you want to buy this product, uh, that's a reason to stop and read the prospectus. And, uh, and, and, and one more thing. In, in terms of these types of products, 
um, I actually did a, a, a three-week review of, of these types of products for, uh, for the AARP book. And I used to write these prospectuses, and I, I, it took me three weeks. I had to, I had to diagram different <laughs> prospectuses to find out what, how you could get that promise and what, what it would take to, uh, to break the promise. And, Jane, essentially, those promises come with a big price tag, right? Uh, you're talking uh, three and a half, uh, four percentage points now you're paying. And uh, on the products that are loaded up are the kinds of things that Julia is talking about. Now, I ask you, if you're going to pay three and a half and four percent, and you don't know you're paying that, by the way, it's scattered all over the prospectus. And forget reading it because it's 350 pages. I've tried to read these as a reporter. Just forget it. You, you can't understand them even when you're reading them. Uh, let's, if you're going to pay three and a half and four percent. Now I ask you, how much is the market going up, please? Mm, mm. That's the fee all in and of itself before you start getting all these wonderful things you're supposed to get. The fact, the fact is that what you are buying with these things ultimately is a fixed lifetime annuity contract at three times the price you would have to pay if you bought an ordinary, old-fashioned, uh, immediate lifetime annuity contract. And people just don't understand that. I say with these uh, complicated annuities, don't do them. Stay away from them. I'm hoping that with this new uh, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, maybe we will get better disclosure on these terrible mm -hmm. products because they are just cost too much and they're not going to give you what you think you're going to get. But Jane, I can't believe that you said don't read the prospectus. Oh, boy. Okay, let's just do this. Wait. I, let's I, just I, wish I, I wish I had one show you here. It is it is a novel length thing, and it's got, you can't believe the language. I, I don't even, I, I mean, you read well, these. Let me, I don't, can you, did you even understand them when you wrote them? Well, let me give you a couple of <laughs> tips a couple for, the, for the audience, a couple of tips as to just how to go about reading a prospectus. All right, let me say, I'm about to go to sleep right now. But, wait, uh, wait, wait, you'll love this. All right, make it, punch it, baby, punch it. Come on. Well, the most important thing to look at is risk. So look at the prospectus in terms of what does it tell you about risk. And then the second most important thing is if something, somebody's making a promise, figure out how that promise can be broken. A and one more thing. Uh, a lot of times people use the word guaranteed when they're talking about investments. Anytime you hear the word guaranteed, make sure you find out what's going on make because sure no guarantee yeah, yeah. is unconditional. And make sure it's backed by the full faith of the United States <laughs> government. That's the guarantee. Let uh, me say one other thing too about Katie here. You know, she she thought that the bank was giving her good advice. She thinks the bank is somehow involved in this annuity. The fact is the, it, that is an insurance salesperson at the bank he or she was selling an insurance product. This is not a bank product. It's an insurance product. And somehow you think the bank is giving you, quote, advice. That is not advice. They are simply selling you something. And you need to think of these people as salespeople just the way a used car is or shoes or whatever. They're salespeople. Very good. I would actually rather deal with a used car salesperson. <laughs> at least I know what's going on. Okay. Uh, by the way, one quick other annuity question because Peter, uh, different than Katie, has a fixed annuity. And he bought it five years ago, and um, and it's actually kind of cool. He he bought it five years ago is uh, with fifty thousand dollars, and it's worth sixty now. And he now so he bought a fixed annuity. He had a nice interest rate. Things were rocking and rolling. This was good, and he has an option to continue at three percent for a big long time, or surrender at full value. He doesn't pay any charges. So. Uh, Jane, should he re-up this annuity at 3%? Well, of course, I don't know how long the time is. 3% is a, a number that makes you say, oh, no, no, that's crazy. But I'm asking, I'm wondering what kind of an investor this, uh, he is. Peter, is that right. his name? Peter, he's 55 yeah. years old, uh, Peter. and we don't Be know much. Because clearly he's very conservative because he bought this kind of annuity in the first place. So it's an, basically it's an alternative to a certificate of deposit. So now if, if what is he going to do with it if he gets out of this annuity? If he's going to buy a certificate of deposit, he's going to get an even lower interest rate. And if he gets out of it, he's going to pay um, taxes on the earnings that he's had. So when you say, I'm going to sign up for 3%, you say, ah, you're crazy. But then if he would otherwise put it into a CD, maybe he's not so crazy for signing up. But I have advice for Peter because I looked this up. 3% is still low in the world of, of fixed annuities today. And there is a website called totalreturnannuities.com. 
And you go to that, and it will give you the rates that are currently being paid on all these fixed annuities. And you can get an, an AA-plus company for something very close to 4% instead of 3%. So I w and then, then what you could do with what you have now is you know, the, the insurance salesperson will help you do this. You don't have to do it yourself. You can roll over the annuity you have now into something that is actually a higher rate. And you can do from annuity to annuity without a tax event. No so tax So we just events. want to make sure yes. everyone gets that. Yeah. But one more, th one thing that I'd like to throw in is that you really have to understand that not nothing is truly guaranteed, that it's really the... Uh, the company, the insurance company that's behind the promise. So you have to check out the insurance company as well. Yes, that's remember right. when we thought mm -hmm. insurance companies were about to fail? Oh, wait, one did. It was called AIG. <laughs> uh, but their annuities actually remained um, intact, thankfully. Uh, uh, actually, this website does show the ratings. Mm -hmm. so, uh, if you can believe the ratings, it gives mm -hmm. you the... It shows oh, the let's not... We can't do ratings. Okay, <laughs> let's do a couple of investment questions because I have you guresses here. Um, Yolanda is a 45-year-old postal worker. She puts 15% of her income... Woo, who into the 401k plan what percent in stock she's got 75 grand in her account let's just let's call yolanda a balanced investor for sake of argument because we don't have enough information about her and by the way if you're going to send us these kinds of questions give us lots of information say i really hate risk it freaks me out or i'm a player or i don't need my money for 30 years or whatever it's going to be give us as much information as you possibly can we can give you better uh responses what do you want to do julie investment advisor extraordinaire how so much in stocks yeah, you can't you can't give a number like that unless you know the full picture. So All if someone right. is well, you can't you can't, <laughs> especially now in this market. And a couple 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 things to think about. If you are acquiring, if you are building assets, if you if you are far away from retirement and you want to grow your wealth, then this kind of market can be a good market for buying in small amounts. The typical dollar cost averaging approach for the small investor right so she's 45 so, years old she's in the postal program she's probably gonna i can do the c stock plan or the f stock plan at the postal workers right yeah so if she goes into the market uh bi-weekly or, or mm -hmm. monthly through her plan that's that's great uh, one of the things that people tend to do in this kind of market is they tend to say i, I want to protect my assets so therefore i'm going to stop my 401k investing or mm. or put everything into money markets or, or a stable value account that's the worst thing to do you have to continue doing your your formula investing uh in in a more volatile instrument like take an s p index if you have that choice um, but then, what about the money that you have accumulated? Let's say you have a large amount of money accumulated in your 401k plan. Um, then you have to be a little more careful. The closer you get to retirement, you have to be much more careful as to that large amount of money. I happen to know that Jane Bryan Quinn is a playa, and she was talking about buying stocks this week. And I mean, today you may be brilliant. I might just today though. But I, I, I hope just 24 hours. Yes, That's all I ask smart for. for 24 <laughs> hours. Um, if Yolanda is 45 years old and she's kind of a generally a balanced investor, where do you think, you know, and so we got 20 years before she's going to need the money. Jane, how much in stocks for Yolanda? Just a ballpark, and we won't hold you to it. Yolanda, you can't go trade on this information. We need more information about you. But that said, what do you think, Jane? Okay, well, I have two things for Yolanda. First, you know, at 45, if she is, you know, 60, 65% in stocks, that's not a bad thing. Assuming she is not in individual stocks, which you know I hate, and mm -hmm. you don't know what's happening with individual companies, but in something, as Julie mentioned, a stock index fund or something that buys the market as a whole, and she's not going to touch it, and she's putting money in regularly, you know, that's not going to hurt her right now. But I have something else for Yolanda, and that is she is in, uh, you know, a... a, a a postal workers program it's a federal program she will have a target date fund that is there That's right target date fund says don't ask jane don't ask julie you know what percentage we don't know but a target date fund is going to say okay you're 45 when are you going to be 65 we have a formula for you you just put your money in it, it we will decide what percentage stocks what percentage bonds how much how much u.s stock how much foreign stock it's all in a single package and as you move towards 65 we will make it a little more conservative for you and i and these funds that are in the postal worker, the federal program, happen to be very uh, conservatively organized target date funds. So I think she's got a good shot just doing that. But Julie may think differently. She may. She may. <laughs> I have one last, I've got one last question that we're just going to get to before we close up shop today. Uh, Janie writes, back in my college years, I worked for a state capital, had a 401k plan. Janie, I don't think you had a 401k plan if you worked for your state, first of all. I just want to be clear that I bet you may have had a some sort of 403B or some sort of Section 457 plan. But, hey, guys, got to read what you have. That's important, too. 
Uh, she never rolled it over or took it out. Can I get the money back now or is it long gone? What are the steps to see if your 401k is still available with an old employer? I love this question. I'm going to answer it myself. So, Janie, go to your old employer, grab your last statement and call the company and verify what you have in your account. And if you can't find a statement or you've moved 14 times, call the HR department and get information. You need to find out where that money is. Once you find that money, you can roll it over. And you can roll it over into an IRA rollover account, hopefully, that uh, when you go through a discount brokerage firm, so these ladies can tell you you're going to buy index funds or exchange-traded funds. Go back, get the information, consolidate these accounts because you lose track of them and you blow it off because you say, ah, it's five grand, what do I care? Except that it's five grand, so you should care. Right, Jane? Okay, I have one, I have one thing to add, so. and that is over this period of time, maybe whatever money was in there was turned over because, you know, private companies can't keep money forever and neither can states, so maybe it was turned over for unclaimed property. Mm-hmm. You can go to unclaimed.org and put in your name and see if there's any money there that is due you that has been turned over by a bank or a, a brokerage firm or whatever. There's lots of money there, so I think, I mean, that's something people should do generally. It doesn't hurt, but this is some some place else she might look to see if her money was turned over there and then she can get it back i love that uh i just want to also say that you know we all the time we come onto the show and we talk about rolling over to discount brokerage firms i did get a question recently about what's a discount broker it is a firm that basically doesn't charge as high fees because it normally doesn't provide advice or with commission-based products and stuff like that so um, I'll just mention one invest, uh, one discount brokerage firm because I want to give a shout out to Charles Schwab, which is a uh, great firm that sponsored this webcast and really helped launch us. So we just want to give a nice shout out to Schwab, help launch Ask the Experts, and um, we're very happy to praise them. There are some other discount brokerage firms. Jane, what's your favorite br- discount broker? Um, Say well, Schwab. Okay, besides Schwab, I, I Vanguard, Vanguard Brokerage. Yeah, it's a good house. Okay, what do you got, Julie? Big discount brokerage um, firm. What do you like? Could, could be TD Ameritrade. TD for Ameritrade for the traders. Uh, all right. We're going to have to close up shop because Megan wants to um, do other stuff. And she's <laughs> our producer and she rules. So I want to thank Julie Jason. By the way, Julie, you, a, a fantastic freshman effort. Oh, thank you. Don't thank you, you think she you. was awesome? <laughs> and Jane Brian Quinn, who is the goddess of everything financial and thankfully with us here at Money Watch. And to you, thank you so much for viewing. If you've got a question, just shoot us an email. Ask the experts at moneywatch.com. Ask the experts at moneywatch.com. We'll be back. We'll be broadcasting. We're going to have a lot of fun. This is going to get more and more fun. And if you guys watch a lot of this and pass it along to every single human being you know, we can start doing it daily. Oh, my God. Wouldn't that be great, Megan? Thanks again. We are so happy to be here. Ask the experts at moneywatch.com. Go to moneywatch.com. Send us your comments. And Roland, do you have any music to play on the way out or not? No music. Gosh, this is really bad. Well, we'll sing something. Just sing to yourself something about women. It is Jill Schlesinger. Say your name. Julie Jason. And Jane Bryant Quinn. Queen (laughs) Jane Bryant Quinn. I didn't say it, did I? I was very good. I didn't mention that other thing. (laughs) Thanks for watching. We'll see you soon.